sage, Lord, lead me, guide me, and, and your ways. Uh, you know, you all know that, and you have heard it so many times. As we begin uh, the new year and prayer, uh, one of the requests that I have heard the most, and probably you have heard it in the circle of friends with whom you've been praying with, is, Lord, I'm searching for direction this year. Uh, I'm changing this. I'm going there. And I, Lord, Lord, I am at the crossroads. Uh, I am praying for God's guidance. Um, God, the, the, may the Lord guide my next step. So a lot of us, as we move ahead with our life, we look for guidance. We look for God. We, we, need, we need God to... We want God. We want to feel God. We want to be aware of God's guiding us. It's important that we feel that, that safety, that connection with God. It's not only me who boasts, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going here, I'm going there, like James says in chapter 4 of the book of James 4. Those of you who says, tomorrow I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm going to start a business here and there, says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You don't know what tomorrow brings. Instead, you should say, if the Lord's wills. So, so we're, it's not how we approach the future the choices. Uh, we have young people uh, that just went up that needs to choose their university. Uh, some of them will be leaving Hong Kong in the coming year as well to relocate in somewhere in the world. Uh, these are important major changes that will impact their life, the life of their families. And all of us, we, we have these, these sorts of important moments and transitions in our life. So. We want to talk about this this morning and find our security in the Lord. Here you find Psalm 23, verse 2 and 3. This is such a wonderful. There is no other text that is quoted as much as Psalm 23 to bring comfort, uh, to soothe our, our, our tears and our broken hearts and to give us a sense of connection with the Lord and bringing us security and safety that we are not going to lack and everything. And I want to bring your attentions on the nature, on the descriptions of our wonderful Lord that is part of our life, how he, he is being described. Uh, look at the expression that you see here in Psalm 23, verse 2 and 3. He, look at all the he, he makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness. This is what he's doing. And one of the important uh, 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 expression is this, is the, the my soul, mention of my soul. My soul is important. My soul, my, my breathing, my life my way of life, where I'm going, what I'm doing, who I am becoming. And the Lord, it is important. I am the sheep, he is the shepherd, and, and my life is important. My well, my well-being is very, very important uh, to him. Restore, uh, the word is bring back to the starting point. The Lord cares about us. And uh, this is like uh, going into a retreat. Uh, you, you remember if you've been going to a spiritual retreat or, or it's actually like a, a dream vacation. Every year when you think about your vacation, this is what you're thinking about. You want a place to lie down? Is that a rest? A place where you can stretch a long chair near the beach or, uh, you know, where there will be water and a lake, an ocean? Or you want, you want the, the green pastures, you can lay there and rest and be refreshed and all of these things. That is the, the dream vacation that you want. Remember when, the, when more, our children were here in Hong Kong with us, we used to go to Bethany Cottage on Cheng Chau Island. This is exactly what we practice. We would lie down uh, by the beach there and just relax and, and be, we would bring our headphones and uh, those times we used to have a CD player. Remember the CD players? And uh, even a cassette tape, even at the er earlier times. Uh, some of you uh, are too young, you don't remember these things. But uh, we would bring our Christian music, sit down in the chair and uh, stay there the whole day, do nothing, just being refreshed. The Lord is a shepherd that leads. 
That's what he does. That's what he does the best. That's what he is, uh, this is his intention. And when it says that he makes me lie down, it's really the, the translation of the, the words. When you look at the Hebrew dictionary, it's really well translated. That's exactly, he caused me to lie down. This is really a real expression. It's not only a poetry or translation made up. It's, it, it says what it, it means, what it says right there. The Lord makes me to lie down. So it's a place of rest. It's a place of uh, refreshing. You know, this is the, some, uh, one theologian says, this is the loveliest image taken from the natural world represented for the imagination. You look at this and you can imagine the beautiful vacation you're going to, to have. So when, when life gets tough and we feel stress, sometimes our focus is blurred and we, we miss and then we, we rush and we try to find a fast way out of the difficulty that we are facing. We try to make things happen. We take matters into our own hand. We don't want that trouble to last any, anymore. So when we forget that this psalm here focus on the good care and the intention of the shepherd and the qualities, it focus on the qualities of the sheep. Do you have these qualities? Are you following the shepherd? Because this is what it is about. There's a shepherd that leads with care. He, this is his intention to take care of your soul, but with the condition that the sheep we are following. We are letting him lead us when it's time. He is guiding us. And other things also, the sheep here, they don't, know, they don't need to know where the pasture is. It's not the sheep who look for the pasture. The sheep are not smart enough for that. They are only to be led to the green pastures, to the water place, to the, 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 to the river and things like this. The, this is the, the shepherd will guide them. They are not guiding themselves. They are not searching for it. They are not going out of their way, try to solve their, their need. The shepherd is taken care. So this is good to start the year when you are planning anything, whether it is a, a marriage, choosing a school, changing jobs, or facing uh, marital situations, or family situation, that the Lord is part of our life, and He takes care of our soul all, all along. And we forget that this God who holds the star in place, and He knows the number of hair on our head, he knows so much about our life and he has a plan for us. And the Lord used the good things of our life and he used sometimes the not so good things of our life. He used it also to further his purposes in our life. And you find this in the life of Joseph, which is such a wonderful, you know, if you are like me, you start a new life, you start new reading plan, and it brings you back to Genesis again, to reading all of the stories. So you read about, uh, you know, Joseph again, and the, the wonderful stories of how God, when he was in prison, when he was a slave, it says God was with him. He was with him as a slave. He was with him in the prison. And he was even blessing him with the, the limitation of his circumstances. He was even blessing him. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God, but I want to insist on that, but God meant it for good. So even the, the bad part that people has done for him, God knew it, and God meant it. It was part of the process. God meant it for good. It's hard for us to understand because that's not how we are made up. We don't want the bad, and the bad is something that we, we want to out of it. We don't recognize God there and the bad things, but when you trust the Lord and you know that your life belongs to the Lord, you can remain in a mood of safety and security. God knows where you are at and he knows. And God meant it for good to bring salvation. And God had been a constant part of the life of Joseph. He was always looking out for him. 
and, and this. So it is God's intention is very well described throughout the Bible. So that's why when you read the word, you will always see the good care of God being stressed and highlight. God wants to guide you, as it says in this text here, into the path of righteousness, of right living, of making the right choice for his name's sake. At the same time, it's good for you, but it also brings glory to the Lord. It's for the honor of his name. You serve, you follow him, and it will bring honor to him at the same time. Just be obedient. Amen? Hallelujah. And then we find this wonderful text that we are so familiar and we love this one so much. You probably have memorized it as well. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. It is such a wonderful text bringing so much comfort. Three precious promises, instructions, teaching, and guidance. And there's a, uh, we can say they are synonymous of one another, but, but they come also with distinction. Instruct, the words I will instruct you is God saying to us, I will make you understand. It's like God doing a work uh, in our intelligence, in our ability to reason and to understand how about God, about His plan, to, to bring us. Because, you know, we have been um, messed up by sin and our spirit of independence, and our pride, and all of these things, and our uh, me first, and uh, let me do it, I, I'm on my own, I'm able to take care of myself. And now, it takes, it takes a while, and it takes a powerful God to change your mind and bring you to a place of understanding the nature of God, the plan of God, the will of God, how God works in your life. It's not just coming just like that. God has to work in our life. God has to reveal himself. God has to inspire us, convict us, and convince us by, by his word, transform, renew us. So it's really guiding through our intelligence, helping us to, to grasp what God is, is doing. You know, man can instruct but only God can make us really understand. It is the, the work of God. Then after that he says, I will teach you which way, in the way also, which way and in the way. And this word here is shooting an arrow and pointing the direction. It's about where you're going, the directions, the, the heavenward uh, going and calling of God. It's, it's pointing out. It is directing which way. You know sometimes you have a, a child, you want to point him along the way. Uh, uh, just walk. I'm here. I'm here. I'm watching you. Just, just, just go this way. This way. Follow this way. So God is, is like that. He's bringing us to find the best pathway for our life. And not only to find it but also to help us stay in it. I will teach you in the way. I will keep you in that way as well. God is part of our life. And then at the end, it says, with my eye upon you. God is watching. God is interested. God is not away. You know, so many times we feel that God is separate because we don't feel him. We don't, we don't, we're not always aware that God is part of our circumstance. But God reminds us, with my eye upon you, I will console you. I, I'm watching you. I'm right there with you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm interested in life. He expressed his desire to be part of our walk. The best pathway for our life is in the heart of God. God wants the best. A way that is pure. A way that is a way of integrity, of honesty. A place that is safe. A place where there is protection. A place where there is prosperity. 
a place where you find wisdom. There is wisdom. When you find the way, the Old Testament says, when you find this way, the highway of the Lord, walk in it. This is, this is the way. Just, just continue to walk in it. Amen? So we, we are being reminded that how God is guiding us. Now I want to transition into an illustration this morning. Uh, coming also from the book of Genesis. Uh, every time I read this story, I, it's, it's a story that I like a lot. It's uh, filled with adventure, with emotions, and there's bad and good, and uh, you know, it's like a TV series. It's the life of, uh, of Jacob. And uh, uh, who can tell me this morning how Esau felt after his brother stole the blessing from him? How was uh, Esau feeling? Murder. Angry. Ah, he was so angry. He wanted to murder his brother. So he threatened to kill Jacob. So what did Jacob do? Ran. He ran away to live with his uncle Laban. Okay. So here we are going to look at the life of Jacob, but by comparing two prayers that are 20 years apart. Okay, one prayer and then 20 years later he prays again. Will there be any difference? Uh, uh, will, will, will he have grown up, being, become more mature? What has he learned from these 20 years between the first prayer and the second, the second prayer? So the first prayer is here. And if I return, he's, he's running away, he's sleeping on the side of the road, he took a stone as, as a pillow, and he has a dream, you know, the stairs, the angels coming up and down, and all of these things, and then he, he prayed to God. There, there's, there's a lot of if in his prayer, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty, and we often feel ourselves that, we that we are like that. Uh, the, the, the if of the Lord. Amen. Our computer is making some, he's getting also older like us, you know, sometimes <laughs> he's, he's coughing a bit this morning, so don't, he's, he'll be okay. Amen. So, it's like it's like J Jacob is, doesn't know his future. He, he's, he's filled with worry. He's alone. He's a lonely man. He's a sad man. And he's a scared man. And many times this is when we feel just like him that we go to God in prayer we, we, with similar emotions. If I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. Means he is not yet my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place of worship, it's like a promise, like a vow. You know, if God does it for me, it's like a, some sorts of a bargaining. God, you do this for me, I'll do that for you. You know, and uh, I will present a tent. I'm going to pay my tithes. I hope you're not making that. This kind of arrangement with God, God, if you help me win on the lottery, I will pay my tithe. Please, no, don't do that. Don't think in this way. Remember that Jacob, when he left, didn't know his future. So he goes to his uncle's Laban's home. He falls in love. Wow, that's great. Great beginning. Falls in love. I told you it's like a TV series. Falls in love. And then he wants to marry. But Laban, you know Jacob is a, is a, is a cheater. Eh? He's a deceiver. But he's meeting a match. You know, <laughs> meeting his, his uncle Laban is also of the same kind. You know, he's tricked Jacob into marrying uh, older sister first. And there's a lot of tricking going on in that series. Trick here, trick there, you know. But there's something that is not being seen, but we should know that God is part of all of this story. God heard that, that first prayer of a lonely, sad, scared man. God heard that prayer, and God is going with him. So for 20 years, uh, Jacob worked hard under the sun. It was cold at night. It was hot during the day. Laban was not fair. He cheated him out of his pay ten times. Uh, that Jacob said, you, you cheated me from my salaries ten times. For 14 years, he didn't gain a salary. 14 years, never being paid. And then later on, then he got something because God was blessing him. 
But God blessed Jacob even though his uncle was a cheater worse than Jacob was. And Laban's son became very jealous. And then one day God tells Jacob to go back home. And then we see that in this text here. The Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. And in that text, even though Jacob never knew it, God was preparing him for the return. Things started to change before the time when God spoke to him. First of all, you look at the second text. Soon after Rachel had given birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, please release me so that I can go home to my own country. So even in, you see, this is chapter 30. God spoke in chapter 31, later on. But before God told them return, there's already a change in his heart. He's already asking to go. I, I got, he got a child. Rachel couldn't have a child. And then she, the, the, the wife that he loved the most, and then he, he got a, a, a Joseph is born, he's ready to go, to go back home. And then his circumstances change. If you look at the next verse, Jacob began to notice a change in Laban's attitude toward him. So they, they started to be jealous and envious, and they want to, to arm him. They, they are they're plotting against him because he has become rich because of God's blessing. So God has been preparing this this call then the lord said to jacob the lord time has come return to the land and i will be with you so that is important at this time the lord gave personal direction and it is often in similar ways uh, more or less with different circumstances different people different faiths that we will be led also change in circumstances, change in emotions, the burden that you used to have for something diminish, uh, sometimes new desires are born in your heart. There's change sometimes in circumstances around you. Uh, then it, it's like something is being birthed in your heart for something new, and then it inclines you into a certain direction that you were not ready at before that. And then God prepares us for that. And finally, the Lord gave directions and a promise. I will be with you. And this confirmed the directions of God uh, and Jacob's life. Why did God have to promise Jacob that he would be with him? Remember the beginning. His brother wanted to kill him. He's in danger. If he goes back, this danger is still there. He's, he, he, and the, you know, sometimes when you... Our memory is a, is a strange uh, faculty. Memory remembers. It remembers the, 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 the bad things that we have done. And sometimes our sins will find out later, or the consequences. God forgives. God gives a new life. And, but the, the remembrance of certain things of our past sometimes comes back. And he cheated his brother, and his brother wanted to kill him. It's still there. As far as Jacob is concerned, this hatred and this danger is still there. So God needs to reassure him. It's time to go, go back to your home. You know, this is also a sad story. Jacob never saw his mother again. We don't know, we don't read anywhere about the death of the mother. But he came back before the father died, but we don't know about the mother. So it's a, a sad story in, in a way for that one. But he, re he returns because God needed to, to reassure him. And then we come to the second prayer, which is a little bit longer here. Then Jacob prayed. And remember, this is, we're talking 20 years later. So a lot of things has happened in him. He has uh, now four wives, well, two and two concubines. He has a lot of children. Uh, he has now flocks. He's, he's rich, you know, in everything in, in terms. Jacob prayed, O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives 
and you said or you promised, you declare, you solemnly uh, said something and God promised, I will treat you kindly or I will do you good, if you're depending on which Bible version you're, you're looking at. God has good intention and it is applied. I will do you good, I will treat you well, I will, I will see that things go, will go well with you. I am, and then Jacob says, I am not worthy of the unfailing love and the faithfulness or the truth. The word that is uh, in the King James is the truth, the, the truthfulness, your trustworthiness toward me, the, the things that you kept alive. I prayed you 20 years ago and you've done so much, so much for me. The faithfulness you have shown me, your servant. When I left, and then he remembered his past. When I left 20 years ago, I was a lonely, sad person, running away, scared. I had nothing except my walking stick, and now my household fills two large camps. Oh Lord, please deliver me or rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid that he is coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promised, or you said to me, he's remembering God again, calling on the promise of the Lord for his reassurance. I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore, too many to count. And we can see how Jacob changed and the way he addressed his prayer we can see now the better side of, of Jacob uh, and his character here. Verse uh, chapter 32 informs us of uh, the circumstance that precede where he started that prayer. He just escaped trouble with Laban. He just ran away from Laban's camp. He's, 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 he's running away at this time. And then the second trouble He's going to meet him ahead. He is soon to meet his brother Esau. So he's, he's in between two danger. That's when he prays this uh, prayer over here. And uh, God is with him. He was soon to meet his brother. And the uh, remembrance of his sin is coming back to, to, to face him. He came... And then you can see the, the, his nature, he's, he's still Jacob. He comes up with a lot of plans. He's a very smart guy. He says, okay, uh, we will organize, I will send some gifts ahead, so I will appease him. So I will send, okay, he sent different groups of, of uh, his servants with different sets of animals and cattle and everything so, to bring a group so, so to appease him. So he's already sorting out how he's going to walk out of his situation again he's a very smart guy but we let, let's look a little bit at this prayer verse 11 deliver me I pray from the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau for I fear him I'm afraid that he is coming to attack me and you can see this part here he is, has become a caring husband and father he cares for his children and he is concerned for his wife and children. And he, is, he mentioned them as they are very near to his heart. We can see also his humility. I'm not worthy. You have done so much for me. I'm not worthy of everything that you have done for me. I was a sad man I, I, when I left. I had nothing, and now I have two camps. I have abundance of cattle and everything, and I have servants and uh, large families, two groups. It's, uh, I'm not worthy of that. And in this short prayer, we can see different arguments. The first argument that you find in this prayer is that he calls on the covenant that he has with God. I'm in the covenant with God. God of my father, you promise the descendants of Abraham. God of my father, Isaac, you promise to Isaac. So he goes back to the covenant. And you and I, we have a better covenant. If you have read the book of Hebrew, we have a much better covenant because we have Jesus Christ in our life. Second, he points out to the promise that God has given him in his prayer. Lord, you told me, return to your own land. And double promise, not only God told him, but God promised to him that he's going to watch over him, that he's going to treat him kindly, do him good. And then the same way, as you walk with the Lord, whether you see it or not, the Lord's presence is with you. Rest 
as sure that as a child of God, as a son and a daughter of God, God is with you, is involved, is watching over you. All of these things applied to you. And this is one of the best arguments in his prayer. As you promise, O oh Lord, as you promise, you said, that is important that when you, we pray, we keep that in mind. So that is, again, emphasizing how important it is for the children of God to feed ourselves with the Word of God. Feed the promises of God, because at some point, these promises will be the only anchor you will have. It will be the only uh, s signs pointing the direction. They will be the only hope that you will have, the only light in the darkness, the only food that you will have for your thirsty soul. That is, these words that you have accumulated into your life, you will only have that. You will not find anything else to support you and to help you. When we came to Hong Kong, our children were very young, uh, 6 to 16. We were poor and uh, life was not so, so easy, but God has always been faithful and shown him, him, himself. And God promised to us, and God was there just as he, he promised. Amen. Hallelujah. Then Jacob argued with God from his past history. Jacob goes back where he's coming from. I was poor. I was alone. I had nothing, only a walking stick. That's all I have. And uh, that is how we, we came to Hong Kong also. We had only our, when we came on, we came with 24 boxes and suitcases from New York to, to Hong Kong when we landed here. People and the team that we, with whom we traveled helped us. We were six for young children and two adults. And we, that is how we had. We, are, we had our, our blankets, our pillows. We had, I had my screwdriver, my hammer, and my, my vice grip. I had, we had our, uh, each one of us are ca were carrying a plate, a ball, a fork and knives, all of, we, we had everything with us. We came in Hong Kong just like, like that. Amen. And now when we are going to leave, we have a full apartment. Please come and get the furniture and uh, get something that you can, uh, please help us. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. His prayer was a prayer of thanksgiving, uh, thankful to the Lord, looking back, you've done so much, you've done so much for us. He went over the Jordan, a sad and lonely man, and now he's got so much with him. Lord, you've been my helper in the past. Now deliver me, I pray. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you are here today, even if you have not yet made Jesus Christ your Savior, that you are uh, sure of your salvation, that if you die today, you would go to spend eternity. If you have not yet made that, even then, maybe you don't realize it, but you have a lot to thank the Lord for because God has kept you alive. You are still here. You know, before I accept Jesus Christ, I should have been dead many, many times over with all the foolishness that I have done in my life. But God kept me until the day that He knocked at my, 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 the door of my heart until I receive and uh, open my heart to receive my Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's true with every one of us. So if you are here this morning, a friend invited you and you have not yet made this decision to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have already a lot to thank the Lord for, just like Him. Look at your past. Look at how God has kept you so far. And today is the day of your salvation. Give your life to Jesus. There's a man, William J., who said, based on the promise here, you said, I will surely do you good, he says, he made four observations of that declaration. You said, I will surely do you good. Number one, God has the ability to do you good. God can do you good. Whatever good it is that you need, God 
is powerful. God is love. God can and wants to give it to you. He has the ability. Number two, God has the inclination. It's part of his nature to do you good. You don't, in a way of speaking, you don't even have to ask. It's already part of God's nature. It's already in his heart to do you good. You don't have to ask. He is willing to bless. It is according to his nature to be gracious. Number three, God is under an engagement. He's already made it clear in the Bible so in so many ways that God is committed to do you good. So many promises. And number four, God has already done good to you. Just, just look back and see how God has done. And just that fact alone should strengthen your faith into the goodness of of God. Amen? So, also I want to say something. God loves you in one specific way. He brought you to Lighthouse. And to me, that is something that He loves you. He brought you here. You could be anywhere. He brought you here because there's something good here and this church for you that you needed. And that was transforming, that was going to lead you, uh, uh, educate you, instruct you, uh, rebuke you, uh, build you up. Uh, God loves you. That's why we are all here in unity. I just wanted to, I felt to say that um, to all of us here today. The Lord has done uh, all of us good. You know, when we came to Hong Kong at first, we were not supposed to come to Lighthouse. We, we thought we would be going to another church that we knew that were uh, linked to a China ministry. And then the second week we were in Hong Kong, we were invited here. And that is the place that we thank the Lord for, that the Lord brought us here. Amen? Amen. The answer that Jacob received, he prayed 20 years later, and God answered him. But you know, God did not answer him as he expected. Uh, I don't know if I have uh, put that one. Oh no, not this one. I did not put it there. But actually, Jacob was left alone just after he prayed for that night. He sent all of his family, his children across the river and stayed there. And the way that God answered this prayer is, the, is through a, a wrestling match. There was a, a, res, a wrestle match between him and God. And it's, it's hard. The theologians don't really know how to interpret this, this part. Why was the meaning of God wrestling with Jacob and God prevailing and, or, or Jacob prevail? Or what does that all mean? Uh, we, we don't know. But it is God did it. It was not a contest, like uh, who is stronger, Jacob or God. It's not, it's not like this. It was for Jacob's sake. Jacob needed that moment of confrontation with God. He had to confront his past. He had to confront his identity. And he had to confront what, he, what God wanted him to become. Because it was like a, the, the, a, a, a break or go, like a, a transforming moment at that point. It was allowed, this wrestling was allowed for Jacob's sake. I, and then later on in this wrestle, uh, the, the, the man who was wrestling with Jacob says, let me go. And says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And it, it shows how Jacob realized and was determined that he couldn't live anymore without God's blessing. He was surrendering. He was, he was holding on. He, he needed to receive the blessing of God. And God concluded this wrestling match by it says that God blessed him and changed his, his, his name. And it says he blessed him there. And it was the, the changing moment. And to all of us this morning, it's much better to trust the Lord with our life than trying and everything. You know, all the plans that Jacob had uh, tried to, to sort out to, to avoid meeting his brother that was so afraid, it was for nothing. He didn't need him. His brother says, I don't need your gift. 
And then he, he hugged his brother and he cried on his shoulder. So he, he, Jacob didn't need to, you know, uh, have all of his uh, smart ideas and action. He just needed to trust in the Lord. The Lord, haven't the Lord told him, it's time to go back, I will do you good? That was enough, isn't it? But no, he needed to try this and try that. So we, 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 don't, we don't need this. And God had not finished with Jacob. You know, we're, we're talking 20 years eh, of, of, of his life. But Jacob was still young when he went back with all of his family. His children were young at that time. How many more years has Jacob lived after that prayer, after that encounter, and after he returned to the land of his relatives and he dwelled there. And I want to uh, close with this here. God had not finished with Jacob, now has become Israel. God has prevailed. He was a new man. God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and reside there, settle there, dwell there, make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. You remember the promise you made 20 years ago? God heard that prayer. God says, if you bless me, you keep me safe, and you bring me back, I will build an altar to you and I will worship you. So God says, hey, I was there 20 years ago when you prayed that prayer. I'm still here with you. I have blessed you. Now it's time to go back and build and, and do it. Just go and worship me. And now that I am uh, with you. And it is uh, wonderful. When you look at the uh, saga of Jacob's life, you see a lot of messy situations. A lot of people doing wrong things. A lot of people making bad decisions. But there's a God that is faithful to his promise in this. And he will be the same God to you. And he will always be faithful to his plan for you. Because Jacob... Uh, return, he raised his families, his family became the, the people of Israel. Jesus Christ came from this family. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for your future. God has a plan, not only a plan to, to bless you and put money in your pocket, but God has a plan to be part of his plan. You, you, that's, that's bigger. That's bigger than the plan just to put money in your wallet and a bank account and make you rich. It's, it's, it's a plan that you, it will guide you to find, to understand, and to walk in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So that your life will count, your life will impact, your life will accomplish a ministry, your life will cause people to find God, your life will build the church, your life will, will grow and will bless others because God is part and he is leading and guiding and faithful to you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Can we stand this morning and finishing with the, the certainty that God says to you and to me and to us and to the church lighthouse, I will do you good. That is what we need to remember this morning. Lighthouse, remember that God is saying, I will do you good. Amen? Amen. That is God's intention for my life, for your life, and for the life of his church. And Lord, I intend to trust and follow you. I want you to guide me in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, as I follow you this year, be my shepherd, guide me, restore my life as you promise to do me good. I surrender to you, I give myself to you, my future, and I trust in you, Lord, oh God, oh God. Hallelujah. Let's give ourselves to the Lord this morning.